A hand closed around Eddie's foot. He had been looking across the canal toward the school, smiling a sleepy, rather beautiful smile as he imagined his stepfather being carried off into the violent rip of the spring runoff, being carried out of his life forever. The soft yet strong grip startled him so much that he almost lost his balance and tumbled into the canal. It's one of those queers the big kids are always talking about, he thought. Then he looked down. His mouth dropped open. Urine spilled hotly down his legs and stained his jeans black in the moonlight. It wasn't a queer. It was Dorsey. It was Dorsey as he had been buried. Dorsey in his blue blazer and gray pants. Only now the blazer was in muddy tatters. Dorsey's shirt was yellow rags. Dorsey's pants clung wetly to his legs, as thin as broomsticks. And Dorsey's head was horribly slumped, as if it had been caved in at the back and consequently pushed up in the front. Dorsey was grinning. Eddie, his dead brother croaked, just like one of the dead people who were always coming back from the grave in horror comics. Dorsey's grin widened, yellow teeth gleamed, and somewhere way back in the darkness, things seemed to be squirming. Eddie, I came to see you, Eddie. Eddie tried to scream. Waves of gray shock rolled over him, and he had the curious sensation that he was floating. But it was not a dream. He was awake. The hand on his sneaker was as white as a trout's belly. His brother's bare feet clung somehow to the concrete. Something had bitten one of Dorsey's heels off. Come down, Eddie. Eddie couldn't scream. His lungs didn't have enough air in them to manage a scream. He got out a curious ready moaning sound. Anything louder seemed beyond him. That was all right. In a second or two, his mind would snap, and after that, nothing would matter. Dorsey's hand was small, but implacable. Eddie's buttocks were sliding over the concrete to the edge of the canal. Still making that ready moaning sound, he reached behind himself and grabbed the concrete, edging and yanked himself backwards. He felt the hand slide away momentarily, heard an angry hiss, and had time to think. That's not Dorsey. I don't know what it is, but it's not Dorsey. Then, adrenaline flooded his body, and he was crawling away, trying to run even before he was on his feet, his breath coming in short shrieky whistles. White hands appeared on the concrete lip of the canal. There was a wet, slapping sound. Drops of water flew upward in the moonlight from dead, pallid skin. Now Dorsey's face appeared over the edge. Dim red sparks gleamed in his sunken eyes. His wet hair was plastered to his skull. Mud streaked his cheeks like war paint. Eddie's chest finally unlocked. He hitched in breath and turned it into a scream. He got to his feet and ran. Ran, looking back over his shoulders, needing to see where Dorsey was, and as a result, he ran smack into a large elm tree. It felt as if someone, his old man for instance, had set off a dynamite charge in his left shoulder, stars shot and corkscrewed through his head. He fell at the base of the tree, as if polexed, blood trickling from his left temple. He swam in the waters of semi-consciousness for perhaps 90 seconds. Then he managed to gain his feet again. A groan escaped him as he tried to raise his left arm. It didn't want to come, felt all numb and far away. So he raised his right hand and rubbed his fiercely aching head. Then he remembered why he had run full tilt into the elm tree in the first place and looked around. There was the edge of the canal, white as bone and straight as string in the moonlight. No sign of the thing from the canal if there ever had been a thing. He continued turning, working his way slowly through a complete 360 degrees. Bassey Park was silent, and as still as a black and white photograph. Weeping willows dangled their thin, tenebrous arms, and anything could be standing slumped and insane within their shelter. Eddie began to walk, trying to look everywhere at once. His sprained shoulder throbbed in painful sync with his heartbeat. Eddie, the breeze moaned through the trees. Don't you want to see me, Eddie? He felt the flabby corpse fingers caress the side of his neck. He whirled, his hands going up as his feet tangled together and he fell. He saw that it had only been willow fronds moving in the breeze. 
He got up again. He wanted to run, but when he tried, another dynamite charge went off in his shoulder and he had to stop. He knew somehow that he should be getting over his fright by now, calling himself a stupid little baby who got spooked by a reflection or maybe fell asleep without knowing it and had a bad dream. That wasn't happening though. Quite the reverse, in fact. His heart was now beating so fast he could no longer distinguish the separate thuds and he felt for sure it would soon burst in terror. He couldn't run, but when he got out of the willows, he did manage a limping jog trot. He fixed his eyes on the streetlight that marked the park's main gate. He headed in that direction, managing a little more speed, thinking, I'll make it to the light, and that's all right. I'll make it to the light, and that's all right. Bright light, no more fright, up all night, what a sight. Something was following him. Eddie could hear it bludgeoning its way through the willow grove. If he turned, he would see it. It was gaining. He could hear its feet, a kind of shuffling, quelching stride. But he would not look back. No, he would look ahead at the light. The light was all right. He would just continue his flight to the light. He was almost there. Almost. The smell was what made him look back. The overwhelming smell as if fish had been left out to rot in a huge pile that had become carrion slushy in the summer heat. It was the smell of a dead ocean. It wasn't Dorsey after him now. It was the creature from the Black Lagoon. The thing's snout was long and pleated. Green fluid dripped from black gashes like vertical mouths in its cheeks. Its eyes were white and jelly-like. Its webbed fingers were tipped with claws like razors. Its respiration was bubbly and deep, the sound of a diver with a bad regulator. As it saw Eddie looking, its green-black lips wrinkled back from huge fangs in a dead and vacant smile. It shambled after him, dripping, and Eddie suddenly understood. It meant to take him back to the canal, to carry him down into the dark blackness of the canal's underground passage to eat him there. Eddie put on a burst of speed. The arc sodium light at the gate drew closer. He could see its halo of bugs and moss. A truck went by, headed for Route 2, the driver working his way up through the gears, and it crossed Eddie's desperate, terrified mind that he could be drinking coffee from a paper cup and listening to a Buddy Holly tune on the radio, completely unaware that less than 200 yards away, there was a boy who might be dead in another 20 seconds. The stink, the overwhelming stink of it, gaining all around him. It was a park bench he tripped over. Some kids had casually pushed it over earlier that evening, heading toward their homes in a run to beat the curfew. Its seats poked an inch or two out of the grass, one shade of green on another, almost invisible in the moon-driven dark. The edge of the seat smacked Eddie in the shins, causing a burst of glassy, exquisite pain. His legs flipped out behind him, and he thumped into the grass. He looked behind him and saw the creature bearing down, its white poached egg eyes glittering, its scales dripping slime the color of seaweed, the gills up and down its bulging neck, and cheeks opening and closing. Ah! Eddie croaked. It seemed to be the only noise he could make. Ah! 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 He crawled now, fingers hooking deep into the turf, his tongue hung out. In the second before the creature's fish-smelling horny hands closed around his throat, a comforting thought came to him. This is a dream. It has to be. There is no real creature, no real black lagoon, and even if there was, that was in South America or the Florida Everglades or someplace like that. This is only a dream, and I'll wake up in my bed, or maybe in the leaves under the bandstand, and I... Then... But trachean hands closed around his neck, and Eddie's hoarse cries were choked off as the creature turned him over. The chitinous hooks which sprouted from those hands scrawled bleeding marks like calligraphy into his neck. He stared into its glowing white eyes. He felt the webs between its fingers pressing against his throat like constricting bands of living seaweed. 
His terror-sharpened gaze noted the fin, something like a rooster's comb, and something like a horn pout's poisonous black fin, standing atop the creature's hunched and plated head, and its hands clamped tight, shutting off his air. He was even able to see the way the white light from the arch-sodium lamp turned into a smoky green as it passed through that membraneous head fin. You're not real, Eddie choked, but the clouds of grayness were closing in now, and he realized faintly that it was real enough. This creature, it was, after all, killing him. Yet, some rationality remained, even until the end, as the creature hooked its claws into the soft meat of his neck, as his cartoid artery let him go in a warm and painless gout that splashed the thing's reptilian plating Eddie's hands groped the creature's back, feeling for a zipper. They fell away only when the creature tore his head from his shoulders with a low, satisfied grunt. And as Eddie's picture of what it was began to fade, it began promptly to change into something else. <laughs>